has heads spinning around Europe and even in the United States, with President Biden diplomatically calling the Prime Minister's U-turn on her unpopular tax-cutting plan predictable. And even the Greek Prime Minister has joked recently about it, telling the Sunday Times that if the UK needs experience with the IMF, he's here to help, referring to the infamous Greek financial meltdown of 2010. And then there was this. When Liz Truss last week walked into her weekly audience with King Charles, he muttered, dear, oh dear, as he greeted her. Your Majesty, lovely to see you again. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Dear, oh dear. The Prime Minister has been on the job not even six weeks and is spending most of that time scrambling to survive. Her new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, today brought down the axe on nearly all of her tax-cutting plan after it had caused chaos in the markets and caused the British people huge pain in their pocketbooks. On top of the high inflation and rising energy costs, which have many here extremely anxious about the coming winter. So let's try to make sense of this very un British crisis with Rory Stewart, the former Tory cabinet minister and now president of Give Directly, and economist Mariana Mazzucato. Let me first ask you, Mariana, we've just been hearing about how she can survive, how the prime, as if that's all that's at stake. How big, first of all, let's talk about people. How big is this for the people of, of the UK? I think it's huge. It's huge not only, well, first of all, because of the massive instability that it's caused, which means that then the pound sank, so people are poorer, relatively, and their mortgage bills, of course, have risen because of what's happened to interest rates. But they're also going to be more uh, worse off, I think, because of what's about to happen, which is that in order to show that the politicians and the, you know, that the minister is actually serious about getting the economy back on its foot, they're about to embark on another massive wave of what we've called austerity, which we know doesn't work. Even the World Bank has written articles on how it was futile after the financial crisis to have 10 years of austerity in the United Kingdom. What does that mean? It means cuts to public education, public health, areas even like public transport. And what's interesting is that the current chancellor was actually the minister of health in the UK for a very long time. He was the you know, longest uh, uh, minister of position, health in yeah. that position. And he was criticized at the time by doctors, by nurses, by junior doctors especially, due to the cuts, the real cuts that were actually made to the NHS, which of course then once COVID hit, we felt. You know, I mean, just like with climate change, the cost of inaction is much greater than the cost of action. So if you're not actually properly funding the social fabric of society, and in this case, you know, public health systems globally should be strengthened, not weakened, this austerity that we're about to experience in order to pay also for some of the tax cuts actually that are going to remain um, is a huge problem. So let me ask uh, Rory Stewart about that. Rory is joining us from Africa. We said that you're now president of Give Direct, um, uh, an NGO, obviously. So you know about this part and you know about this team because you've worked closely with them in various incarnations. What do you think will happen, not just to Liz Truss, but, but to the stability of this country? Do you fear, as the IMF chief has said, that there may actually be instability on the streets? Well, I, I definitely think we're going into a terrible situation. I think it's almost inevitable now that we're going into recession along with inflation. I think that Liz Truss, the new prime minister who's only been in a few weeks, is likely to be toppled almost immediately because uh, within a few weeks, she's taken her party into a situation where it is 30 points behind in the opinion polls. If they were to go to an election on the current polling today, they would be almost wiped out as a party, and most of these members of parliament would lose their seats. So I think the great um, challenge now is whether Liz Truss is able to survive a few weeks, and if she doesn't, who's going to replace her? Rory, people have been asking about the mechanism for that, because, I mean, to be honest with you, it's also about democracy, and we're going to get to that in a moment. This leader was not elected by the people, but by a, a, a fraction of the actual paid-up membership. How, what is the process for, quote-unquote, toppling this particular uh, prime minister? How does it work? Well, so, so the, the answer is that, at the moment, the MPs are supposed to to firstly put in a letter. So if enough people put in a letter of no confidence, that is supposed to bring down the prime minister. But there are rules to try to prevent that happening within 12 months. So all those rules would have to be ripped up. 
And the truth is, of course, they would be ripped up because it's a parliamentary system of government. If she can't command enough of her MPs to win a majority, she can't survive. So the MPs have the power here if they want to use it. The second thing is that they're then supposed to produce two candidates to the party members. And as you say, the party members are only 150,000 largely quite elderly right-wing people who represent about 0.2% of the British population. So the real democratic change actually paradoxically is to bring power back to the MPs and let the MPs who are themselves elected elect the prime minister because although there are a few MPs at least they're elected the party members are not elected they just have to pay mm -hmm. a few pounds a year and they've produced with Boris Johnson and Liz Truss two disastrous prime ministers in a row and just just to to the other point that you know the labor labor party if they you know if there was an election today they would win according to the polls but you can't even trigger an election, right, without... because it's a fixed term. So, if the MPs wish to stay, they can stay for another two years. And, of course, at the moment, they would be, as it were, Turkey's voting for Christmas. If the Conservative MPs dissolve Parliament, uh, two-thirds of them would lose their seats. So, the likelihood is that instead of calling an election, they will try to bring in another leader. They've got a 100% chance of losing under Liz Truss. They've maybe got an 80 90% chance of losing under another leader. Mariana, before we get further deeper into the actual financial and economic uh, fallout, what about the democratic situation? I mean, all of this is taking place, as Rory just laid out, um, from the second prime minister in, in several years, well, since Brexit, who was not elected by the people. And... It's very hard to see how it can go to an election. Does the democratic part of this trouble you and affect anything to do with the economics or the finances, the macro picture? Well, I'm not a political scientist, but for sure all this instability, as I already mentioned, is not good for the economy, hence for the people who require jobs. They'd like to see their wages actually rising due to investments that we're actually making in what should be an infrastructure program, a green program, like many other countries, by the way, Europe, which we've decided to leave, has a massive economic plan right now called the Next Gen EU mm -hmm. Recovery Program. It's about 2 trillion euros, which is being distributed to the member states, conditional on that they actually have a climate strategy and a digital divide strategy. But the key word there is strategy. Mm -hmm. To have a strategy, you also need to plan. To plan, you need time. You need civil servants that aren't constantly moved from one ministry to another. Lots of the people that I personally was uh, working with at one point that were in the ministry that Kwasi Kwarteneng was running at the time, the business ministry, then were moved over to the Brexit uh, problem. Now they're you know, being shuffled around. So this instability at the civil service level is tragic when you're actually trying to implement an economic plan, whether it's the leveling up agenda, which is trying to make the north of the country you know, just as well off as the south, but especially the kind of investment that we need from both the public and the private side all of that, of that is about collaborating on particular projects. If there's no project, there's no planning, there's just lots of instability, mm -hmm. this is definitely bad for everyone. But I should also say that, you know, if we're talking about democracy, one of the things that isn't being talked enough about is that part of the plan that hasn't been uh, changed has been, you know, for example, an attack on trade unions. It was very explicit in the plan that they were also going to, you know, make this a low regulation, low tax haven. They've gone back on some of the tax. They haven't gone back the regulation bit, um, and the bit about trade unions. You know, we've just lived through, in, in, in recent months, also a big strike by the rail and transport sector, which people actually became very attuned to because of how eloquent the you know, head trade unionist was talking yeah. about the problems being faced by working people. And this isn't about being pro or against you know, any specific politician or even trade union leader. It's about how do we set a plan where the trade unions, government and business can together be at the table and plan for the future. And we have the opposite of that. We have a union bashing government, a low regulation government, a low tax mentality, regardless of whether some of these taxes now aren't being changed. And what we really must be talking about is how do we learn from the mistakes of the past? And I repeat, the mistakes of austerity are widely recognized everywhere in the world. And what really frightens me is that in order to calm the financial markets now, given what's just happened in the last week or so, the austerity is going to be introduced as a way to show that the government isn't going to be irresponsible. Right. And that is the most irresponsible thing that the UK government can do, to reintroduce austerity, which weakens.